Uh, Brady, I'm actually going to talk about uh, the thermionic valve, but uh, um, everybody recognises a valve like this they might find on their plumbing system at home. So if the valve is closed, then no water flows, and if it's open, then I can, uh, can see through it. And if it's half open, then only half the flow uh, goes through. And of course, what will be really nice is to be able to have an electronic version of that. If we think about what was happening a hundred years ago, or just over a hundred years ago, the age of the electrical world, if you like, obviously motors were around, uh, lamp bulbs and so on. We could switch them on and off, but we couldn't control the amount of electricity going through them uh, easily. Somebody like Edison, who would, uh, who would obviously building lamp bulbs, he, he was quite intrigued as to why his lamp bulb was going black on one side and not on the other. Something strange was happening inside the actual uh, device itself. And in point of fact, what it was was carbon atoms were actually heading towards one side of the uh, filament. Um, if you like, the very first particle uh, accelerator. And then of course, people like J.J. Thompson took those ideas on and started to try and investigate where, what were these mysterious particles and, and uh, rays and so on. One of the early experiments was something called the Maltese Cross Experiment. And I've got one of those uh, just here. If, if you can, uh, can see this one, this is a modern version of the Maltese Cross experiment, but uh, clearly it's, a, it's almost identical to the uh, original. We can see uh, an anode uh, just in there. It's made out of metal uh, and it's powered by a, a high voltage, which is coming from the, uh, from the power supply. We also have a cathode. Uh, we eventually find out that the, the actual rays that are coming from the cathode, so-called cathode rays, are indeed electrons. And of course, that's the breakthrough that JJ uh, Thompson uh, made. So what's, what's going on? I think we probably need the, uh, the light off, if you can manage that, yeah, really. Yeah, we can do that. We can't see the, the cathode directly, but we can see the light that's given off by the cathode. But what's happening is the electrons are boiling off and they're being accelerated by the electric field towards the, uh, towards the anode. Now, if we're very careful, we can uh, turn up the high tension supply and now we can, uh, we can see the, the green glow, the phosphorescence, uh, of, which is caused by the high speed electrons well, we're seeing the ones that have missed the target and are hitting the, uh, hitting the phosphor. We get a, a shadow of that, uh, of that cross. Why it's called the Maltese Cross experiment, why they put a Maltese Cross in the first place, we don't, uh, we don't really know. Another little uh, interesting thing that uh, we discover is that if I take a little magnet and point it towards the beam, then the magnet deflects the electrons in the beam. Remember that these devices become the forerunners of things like the cathode ray tube, which used to be in televisions until a, a few years ago, where we actually use the magnetic field to deflect the, uh, the electron beam and cause a spot to travel about on the, uh, on the phosphor, thus making our, uh, our picture. Okay, well, we've got to, we've got to come forward a, a few years and, and think about um, a chap called uh, John Ambrose Fleming, who was, in point of fact, uh, the very first professor of physics in 1881 um, at, uh, here at Nottingham. However, he only stayed one year. He went off to uh, do other things like uh, invent the thermionic diode. What he discovered was that uh, he could make a device which only conducted electricity one way because if I connected the anode and cathode around the wrong way then we wouldn't get anything. Um, so current only flows through this device in one, uh, in one direction. What was even more useful, it was something that a chap called Lee de Forest came up with in 1906. I've got a nice little diagram of a of a thermionic diode on the, uh, on the board already written. We can see the, the filament, we can see the cathode, we can see the anode. What Lee de Forest did was put in an extra so-called control grid, as he called it. And by controlling the voltage, we'll call it controlling the voltage on that uh, input there, he, could, he found that he could control the current that was flowing through, uh, through the diode. In fact, the important thing is that a very small change in the voltage 
produces a large change in current. We have a, a, an active device which will increase the power of a, of a signal and so that really is the vital breakthrough. So obviously we connect the heater up to a, to a voltage and this heats up the, uh, the cathode and what would happen is that the electrons jump out of the surface of that, uh, of that heated, uh, heated metal but obviously soon return to it. If we apply an anode voltage, a large anode voltage, then these electrons get swept up along and towards, uh, towards the anode. So um, hence the flow of the electrons is always towards the, the higher voltage. However, notice that the current flow, I, is conventionally in the opposite direction. It's one of the things our forefathers got wrong, uh, in a sense, um, which has confused, um, confused us ever since, really, is that they, the electron flow is opposing the actual conventional current flow. If we put a, a voltage on our, on our input, that disturbs the electric field caused by this uh, anode to cathode uh, field. And effectively, what what happens now, instead of the electrons flowing, flowing up, they get, they get stopped and, and obviously fall back uh, and so on. So we can control that. If we look at what a, a real valve is, this is, a, this is, a, this is quite, a, quite a meaty one. But this, this device itself um, would be used as a, a radio transmitter valve. And in point of fact, uh, something like this is, uh, is, is still in use because although valves were superseded by um, solid state devices from about the 1960s uh, and so on onwards. Um, a transmitting valve like this is still the most efficient, uh, uh, efficient and cost effective way of, uh, of, of transmitting. So even in our MRI scanner, 3T current MRI scanner, we actually have a valve amplifier um, because it's the only way you can cost effectively get 25 kilowatts of RF power. Well the glass is, uh, is, is of course there to keep the vacuum in, so inside we have a complete vacuum and it's, the vacuum is sucked out through this little, and sealed through that little, uh, little spigot. And it has to be that big because of course it gets very hot and so we need to conduct the um, heat away. Why the vacuum? Because if we have, if we had if we have anything in air molecules in, inside there, then the electrons will, will scatter off uh, and uh, we, won't get, uh, we won't get any, um, any flow at all. There are still people around who, who swear by valves, particularly audiophiles. They love to, to use uh, valve amplifiers. And although this is a little bit more of an antique uh, device down here, again, if you switch the lights off, uh, Brady. Let's do that. Let me you can see the, the, the valves glowing, uh, glowing away. Um, these, these are amplifying valves at this end and then this is the output stage valves. And this is actually the um, a rectifier diode um, being used to rectify the power supply. And this, is, uh, this is an audio amplifier, so connect it to a, a loudspeaker and feed it with a signal from your record player and uh, you will get sound out.